Danielle knows what I'm talking about. Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 64, Gaming for a Good Cause. Raise money for charity through gaming. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and live from Windsor, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mochi. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. All right, Extra Life, a big, massive, worldwide charity gaming event is coming up fast, really fast. It is a week from Saturday is the big day. So today, I'm going to be talking about some of the things that have worked for us to raise money for charity through gaming. I've also got a review of one of the Exit games, uh, The Secret Lab in particular, and a bunch of games to talk about from a horror-themed game night I attended in our final Bellhops Tabletop segment. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com, that's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. All right, last week we talked quite a bit about uh, the board game Anachrony and how much of a pain in the butt that game is to teach uh, compared to how well it actually plays. Keith J. Davies had a comment about that. He wrote, I mostly agree. Anachrony plays way more easily than the teach suggests. Once you get into the flow of it, it's really not that hard. Set up and tear down can be awfully time consuming, though. It's better now that I've got the folded space insert. Well, Keith, I have to say, Folded Space has some really nice inserts, and this one looks to be no exception. Not only do they sell, seem well-designed, but they're also foam. They're so light, just like this one from Folded Space. <laughs> <laughs> now, 50 pounds of squirrel, at Biff Q, uh, at Biff underscore Q on Twitter, uh, had a comment about our list of games, good for both experienced gamers and new players. They write... Just Desserts is a quick game to pick up that my non-gamer spouse likes quite a bit. Uh, thanks there, 50 Pounds of Squirrel. Uh, I have played Just Desserts. Actually, it's one of the first games I ever received a review copy of going back quite a few years. I gotta say, it's a great gateway game, but I do worry that there's not enough there to keep an experienced gamer interested for more than a round or two. Now, I could see breaking it out like as the... Icebreaker at the beginning of the night, like as a warm-up game, or maybe bring it out one week, but I can't see it being a game I keep in a regular rotation with experienced gamers and non-experienced gamers. Good suggestion as a warm-up, though. Texas Nerd Games, at Texas Nerd Games on Twitter, has more to say on this topic. This is the article I needed, but I didn't know I needed. My family is about half and half gamers and non-gamers, so I run into this often. This article is golden. Thanks. Funny enough, several on your list are ones we already have in our rotation, but I did see a few in there I might eyeball. I might even recommend one for a future edition for you too, The Great Del Moody or Corporate Shuffle. It was my family's window into that type of gaming. Oh, and Dutch Blitz has always been widely popular around our family as well. Catches on well with non-gamer family members too. Well, thanks, Texas Nerd. We'll be sure to list your suggestions in the show notes. Uh, I also, I interestingly, saw some Twitter conversations about uh, the concept of gateway games as a term. Uh, unfortunately, that was uh, before the election, and finding those in Twitter right now would be difficult. Yeah, uh, that, that would be rough. So last week's topic was popular. Th- uh, uh, was popular. Thing 12 Games had this to say, a rock-solid list, and I've used nearly all of those games for that exact purpose. There are some others I'd like to add, like Mintworks and our own Click Click Boom and Dice of Crowns games. Thanks, Thing12. Uh, again, we're going to toss these in our show notes for our listeners to check out. Uh, if I have a chance and I've seen any of them, I haven't played any of those myself. Mintworks in particular does look really cool. It comes with a little mint thing for it is a really good gateway worker placement game. Up next, a couple comments from our conversation on player aids. I think this goes back two weeks at this point. Chris Groff writes, 
I've downloaded several player aids from the esoteric gamers over the years, and I can say we've never used them. The information on them is fantastic, but they just don't get used. Once we know the rules, the aids don't get used, and while learning the rules, they just ask me, or rather consult the rule book, because the players don't trust the aids enough or the info on them. Well, thanks, Chris. I must say then you've either got a better memory than I do, or you play games more regularly. One of the big benefits that I've found about the esoteric uh, gamer sheets is that they're a great refresher when you haven't played in a while. Uh, just like when uh, Anchi Games and I sat down to Suburbia, I'd never played before, which is one problem, but Anchi Games hadn't played in a number of years. And so while she knew how to play the game, getting it set up and getting refreshed is just so much easier if you've got that quick guideline there that's more, uh, you know, a better summary than the rule book mm -hmm. is. Now, finally, Ivan Sorensen writes, I'll say that I tend to rely on the book more, but a nice reference sheet is always welcome. I'm pretty sharp at memorizing and internalizing rules, so unless a game is one where you need a table to play, I ain't been shot, mum, <laughs> roll master, it tends to get pretty, uh, to get memorized pretty quickly. Well, thanks for the comment, Ivan. Uh, I've got a pretty good memory for games, but I know it's not perfect, so I like to have reference sheets and such around just in case I need them. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares comments and interacts with our content. We start Isn't Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell. Isn't Zanister one of our... I, I think uh, he is. I was about to say that. I was just... I'm like, I, I, I got rid of one of our subs. No, okay. and I just try... I'm trying to unban... Uh, basically I'm like, I'm like, you banned one of our subscribers. That's not nice. Yeah. Like, I was sitting there. Okay, I've unbanned him. I, he's no longer banned. He's no longer banned. Can someone send them a message, please? Yeah. And be like, hey, welcome back. Sorry. Okay, he's already back in the chat room, I believe. <laughs> I'm like, yes, we did see the foul. I got to admit, our moderator is just like, oh, I saw foul language. That person's probably going to be mean. But, but sorry, Zanister. But unfortunately, sometimes, yeah. In case they went anywhere and then I hit submit by mistake. So I was going to say, I'm like, I'm pretty sure Zanister, I don't know about <laughs> subscriber, but at least a follower. Yep. All right. Thanks. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate, appreciate the understanding. Uh, <laughs> they said we, we saw the swear. And I admit, I saw the same thing. I saw the F word there and I was like, oh, oh okay. Never mind. That's someone we know. I, I, I was actually typing the way my wave in there to him as, as, as you got banned. And, but I was trying not to cringe on All the right. stream that I won't edit because we're in the lobby now. So I can, yeah, I can tweak this as, so, as so I was like, I saw it happen. We're in the middle <laughs> of the thing and I'm like, don't interrupt Tom. Let him keep going. <laughs> we'll get to the lobby. So some people are already talking about how we're kicking people out of our chat room by accident, <laughs> but that's all better now. Uh, other topics we've talked about are cling stickers or uh, color forms for gamers. Yeah, I, I've seen some really good ones over the years that um, if you laminate your, your battle maps or if you use the Paizo ones that have that coating on them so you can use dry erase on, the color forms are great. They don't always work on the paper maps, so it totally depends. Right. There yeah, you no, go. Xander is going to prime us. Awesome. We got to kick more people out. It seems <laughs> like that's the thing to do. Uh, yeah, no, uh, the, yeah, you do have to watch out what kind of paper you're on. If it's, yeah, if it's that paper. cheapy paper that, that, that sort of has, is rough, then it won't yeah, necessarily you, you basically come off. need gloss. Yeah. Gloss or, or uh, not varnished, um, laminate. <laughs> yeah. Laminate. Yep. Um, All right. Um, so today we're talking about raising money raising money for charity. And what I want to know from you fine folk in the lobby is if you've done any gaming for charity and what you've done to raise money through gaming. Now, I know Danielle in the chat, Major Kayla, did a ton of work last year at QCC raising money for Child's Play. Now, as far as I know, that was only through an auction, but there may have been more going on behind the scenes that I'm not aware of. So feel free to share that, and we will be back talking about it later. We'll be back checking in with the lobby a few more times during the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. If you can find a social media site we're not on, point it out because I'll go swat the name if nothing else. Now, the best way for questions to get to us is through the website. They won't get missed. They won't get lost. They go right into my Gmail. It's perfect. 
If it goes by on Twitter, there is a chance I'll miss it. I'm not going to say no, though, if you ask me a question anywhere on the web or, heck, in person. Well, in about a week, a uh, week and a half, gamers over all over the world are going to be gathering in support of the Extra Life Charity Gaming Marathon that raises money for Children's Miracle Network hospitals. Now, here in Windsor, this is going to be my seventh year helping to organize the local Extra Life efforts. And one of the questions I get asked all the time by local gamers, people who are involved in Windsor Extra Life, or even online when I'm talking about supporting Extra Life, is what can I do to help raise money through tabletop gaming? And that's what I want to talk about today. What we've found works over the years, what's worked for us, lessons we've learned, and other great ways to raise money for charities through gaming. And not just for Extra Life either, what we're going to talk about today could be for any fundraising event. Now, not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but the most basic way to raise money playing games is pretty simple. You schedule a game day and then ask people to donate money while you play. Asking friends, family, and strangers for pledges towards a cause is basically the tried and true method of raising money for any charity event that's been around probably since the dawn of time. Your basic gameathon idea. Play games, give money, everybody wins. Now, this pledge drive can be done by dropping off pledge sheets. Uh, that's probably one of the most common ways. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen these in your workplace or in your school. Uh, you could always bring a sheet in. Uh, you could go door to door in your neighborhood, or you can hit up local businesses, local stores, or hit up people at the local game store, especially for a gaming event. More common nowadays, though, of course, is to look for donations online. Now, most charities themselves have online donation pages, and getting people to pledge is more just a matter of going to the site, signing up, and then sending out tweets or social media posts. Now, this is the way Extra Life does things. We've got a Windsor Extra Life page set up where people can donate and join our team. Now, even if people can't donate online, social media is a fantastic place to get the word out about your fundraiser, as well as contact people directly when looking for donations. The key to success in these cases is numbers. You can't expect a lot of people to be donating $50. But mm -hmm. if you can get $50 or 50 people to give you $10 or even $5, you're doing great. Well, it's not much fun and actually requires footwork. Actually getting out there, letting people know what you're doing, and just asking for support is often one of the best ways to raise money. It's awkward and gamers aren't always the most social people. So check with friends and family first, get a couple of donations on the page so that if you do, are repeat, uh, reaching out to random strangers, they aren't at the top of the list and it makes it easier to break the ice and get money flowing. Now, while someone might not be willing to support just a regular game night, hey, we're going to go play some games, you should give us money, right? That, that's a hard sell. People are going to be more interested in supporting something special, something more than just a normal game night, like, say, a gaming marathon. This is where people are going to play one game for an extended period of time, like, say, we're going to play D&D &D for 24 hours, or we're going to play multiple games over a larger period of time. Now, this is the secret of the success of Extra Life itself. The main event is a charity gaming marathon that asks the participants to game for 24 hours. Now, these 24 hours don't have to be in a row, but they do ask all the participants to play games for a total of 24 hours at some point leading up to the event or on the day of the event. Now, due to this, our Windsor Extra Life event is going to be running from 10 a.m. Saturday, November 2nd until 6 p.m. Sunday, November the 3rd. This gives players 33 hours to get their 24 hours in. No, 33 hours because daylight savings time hits during then. So we're going to get an extra hour that night. So in addition to this, because we don't want to unduly stress people out, we also held a 12-hour Extra Life warm-up event back in August. Now at this event, players could get in some charity gaming hours early and bank them, basically. That way they didn't have to do it all at once. That's something I did. I've already gamed for 12 hours back in August for Extra Life, and I'll be gaming a lot more in the coming weekend. Now, while gaming for 24 hours straight is definitely more impressive, and it might even raise you more money, it's just not healthy. And we don't want anyone risking their health for the sake of a gaming event, even if it is a charity gaming event. The human body isn't designed to do much for 24 hours straight. But sitting in one place and staying awake definitely isn't in the plan. Yeah. Know your body 
and your limits. Stretch, eat, move, and if you need to, stop. It's okay. All right, getting a group together to play board games isn't usually that hard. I realize there are some people out there that do struggle with this, and I apologize. We have other episodes on trying to find a game group. Casual gaming is usually pretty easy to come by nowadays, whether it's just with friends or at a gaming cafe or local game stores. Like, there's gaming sites popping up everywhere. Barnes & Noble's host game nights, the Chapters Indigo house game nights. You can pretty much find a game night anywhere nowadays. What isn't common, though, are competitive board gaming or competitive events where players are going to be rewarded for playing. That's why tournaments are so popular. A simple board game tournament like the Windsor Extra Life Board Game Blitz we spoke about last week even. Now, the Board Game Blitz is a multiple round no elimination tournament featuring a wide variety of games. Not every tournament has to be like this. For example, the Tecumseh Corn Fest, which is a local farmer's festival, the, a fall harvest festival, features the Settlers of Catan tournament every year. That showcases not only one game, but it's also set up in a traditional bracket format where players are eliminated each round. Other formats are, of course, possible. There are tons of tournament formats out there. No, absolutely. And you can pick up more tips for tournaments from our last episode, The Mixer. Now, the big decision when hosting a board game tournament is figuring out what you're going to do for prizes and how you're going to actually raise money for your charity that you're supporting. Now, the easiest way to do this, I got to say, is just charge an entry fee and split that so that so much of the entry fee goes towards the donations to the whatever charity you're supporting. And the other half goes toward or half or whatever percentage you choose goes to prizes. Now, this is what I've done in the past. I usually do 50 50, to be honest. A better option, though, is if you can find someone, whether it's a local store or a game publisher, a designer, someone in the local community to donate the prizes, then you can give more or all of that entry fee to the charity. While hosting the tournament, too, you can also add in additional incentives to get people to show up and additional ways to donate. Things like door prizes, raffles, items for sale, and so on. Now, the Extra Life concept really started out as more of a video game concept. And that's okay, because a lot of those same ideas work for us in the board game world as well. There are a lot of similarities to running a successful event mm -hmm. as running a successful stream, and the one big thing streamers do, and the, the you'll see all the big streamers doing mm -hmm. this to keep people attention, is giveaways. It keeps people hooked, it keeps people wanting more. That's what we need, that's what we're doing wrong. We gotta start giving stuff away. That, that, <laughs> that'll be our, our, new, our new secret. <laughs> all right. People love the chance to win something and are often willing to spend money for a chance, even if the odds aren't so good. I found people are willing to spend even more of their hard-earned money when the money's going to a good cause. For this reason, things like raffles, draws, door prizes, and other giveaways can be fantastic for raising money for charities. While it may sound crass, whatever you can do to separate people from their money, it's for charity. Yes. Uh, raffles. Pretty simple, right? People buy tickets of some sort for a chance to win something. If it's a gaming event, you're probably going to give away games. Or or even better sometimes is things for games. Stuff like dice. Things where no one's going to win a game they already own, right? Uh, check out our gift guides on the webpage for lots of non-game gift type of ideas. But anyway, what you're going to do is you're going to sell tickets. You're probably going to have a discount for buying five tickets or an arm length or something. Uh, the thing to watch here, though, which is really important and a lot of people may not realize, is make sure your raffle is legal. This varies by state to state, province to province. In some places, a raffle is considered gambling, and you have to have a gambling license in order to host a raffle. It's true, actually, here in Windsor for some things, and it's kind of up in the air for some other things. We, we've had debates over this. Uh, most of the time, yes, the authorities will overlook it for charity purposes, and if you're making under $10,000, maybe your extra life raises $20,000, then it becomes an issue. Raffles are another case where you can use the money gathered to provide a prize as well, with only a portion of the proceeds going to charity, right? Your standard 50-50 draw, except the other 50 doesn't go to the house, it goes to a prize. Uh, it goes to the charity, right? People take home 50, their 50 goes to charity. Even better, though, is the same thing I mentioned with the tournament, is if you can get someone to donate prizes, then all that money raised can go to the cause. Now, we aren't lawyers, we don't play them on TV either, so... Check your local, uh, check your local rulings for, uh, any yes. gambling laws. Yeah. Raffles can fall under gambling. That's basically the concern. Any giveaways can too. 
You may have to have your person who wins enter a skill testing question. And then it's a prize instead of a giveaway. All things to look into. Now, draws and giveaways work best when you have an event that has an entry fee or something else that supports your charity gaming efforts, right? Like you're having that board game tournament and charging people to play. While the draw itself, like if you're just going to draw or do, do door prizes, aren't going to raise you any money on their own. It's the fact that you're having the draw that will increase attendance at your event. Just the fact that you're giving away something for free can be an incentive enough for some people to come out to your event. People love easy and free stuff. It just works. And once they're in the door, then you get the other options. Yeah. Now, another thing you can do is sell stuff, sell stuff to make money at your charity gaming event. When there's a charity involved, I find that people are more willing to spend their money often on things they may not have bought in the first place if they didn't have a cause to support. Now, there are a ton of things you can sell at a gaming event to raise money. You could ask local gamers, publishers, stores, and distributors to donate games and then sell them at the event with all or a portion of the proceeds going to the charity. Like this can be a great chance for local gamers to clear out some old games from their collection and support charity at the same time. Yeah, and just try to stay on theme. Selling antiques might not be your best choice <laughs> at a board game event, but then again, if you know your market, <laughs> Yeah, I can't see that going over overly well, but we did sell a sword at one of our Extra Life events, so that's the case. Now, what we found is a really classic thing is bake sales. Bake sales always do well at our charity events. This is especially true when combined with a marathon gaming event like Extra Life. People like snacks and treats, and well, the longer they're there gaming, the more they're going to be tempted to pick up something to munch on. Now, for our overnight events, the secret here, now we do have the best pizza in the world, so that's partly why, is order pizza at midnight and then sell off the slices for a bit more than the cost of the full pizza. The difference gets donated to the charity. Especially if you can do little things like rounding up. If that slice costs a buck fifteen and you sell it for two, people mm -hmm. won't bat an eye at $2 for a slice of pizza, and you'll probably even sell more than if you were asking for exact change. Yeah, very true. Yeah, we tend to round up. And even better, if you can get a local pizza place to donate, we did have a, a place do that last year, which was fantastic. Unfortunately, the place has since burned down. Nothing to do with us. Now, a game-filled charity auction can bring in a lot of money. Over the years, our most successful moneymaker in seven years of running Extra Life events here in Windsor have been our annual Geek and Gaming Live auction. It's going to be a live auction it's held in the middle of our big gaming marathon uh 7 p.m on saturday this year usually around that time it usually goes for about two hours for weeks leading up to this event we asked local gamers to donate new and used games and other geeky items we also we've had pokemon star wars superhero stuff right most geeks and gamers there's a lot of overlap there now in addition we approach a number of local businesses as well as non local and non local tabletop game publishers looking for donations. By the day of the event, we usually have around 200 items to auction off, which is amazing. Now, just remember that you have to manage, organize, and transport all those items. Yes. And that includes making sure they remain in the condition that you got them in. Yes. Now, due to the overwhelming support we've gotten over the last couple of years, with our auction, we've actually started to split things now. So not only do we have a live auction, we also have a silent auction. Uh, we handpick basically the, some of the best items that have been donated and allow people to silently bid throughout the entire event. Uh, this lets us keep the live auction down to a reasonable time limit, somewhat reasonable time limit, uh, and help save the auctioneer's voice on the day of the event because they don't have to necessarily sell all 200 items. Now, both auctions raise us a ton of money. Both formats work. Whatever works for you, it's worth doing. Um, I do know people, another local store also does a raffle-style auction where you there's a bunch of different items and you drop your raffle tickets into it. Again, check with raffles and local laws. Also with auctions, true, actually check with auctions and local laws. There might be something for that too. Literally more than half of what we raise every year has come from these auctions. Like this is the biggest thing that has worked for us. Now I'm not guaranteeing it will work for you, but like we have people come from out of town just to participate in these auctions because it's so much stuff and the prices usually go for better than MSRP. People are usually getting deals. Plus we usually get some sweet stuff like promos that you can't necessarily get anywhere else. Like I've still got a uh, Will Wheaton Felicia Day for Dead of Winter auction this year, stuff like that. Now, now, like Sean mentioned, though, this does take quite a bit of work to organize, but I think a gaming auction can be one of the best ways to raise money for charity where gaming is concerned. 
So auctions can, of course, have their problems, though. So if you've never run one, make sure to go out and see a couple. See if you can find out what works, what doesn't. Try to learn ahead so that your first one can be the best it can be. And then you'll just keep getting better from there. You will make some mistakes. There will be some slip ups. But we have some tips to help you get off on your right foot. Yeah, start off, set a starting bid uh, long before the auction starts. Don't be up there on the stage trying to decide where to start your starting bid at. You want the starting bid to be low because you want people bidding. But if it's a rare item, don't start it too low. You don't want a signed Batman drawn by Matt Finch going for $20, as I've seen locally. Dave Finch, sorry, I said Matt Finch, Ron, Ron Finch, Dave Finch, Batman. Um, people are looking for deals, but... If you've got like a $40 game, start at five bucks. Um, that's a big one. Note this price on an index card. Index cards are going to save your life. This is what I've learned having now done seven of these things. Our first one didn't go that smoothly. Our last one went better than ever. You're going to note things on the index card with the starting bid, but also the MSRP for the game or item because someone's going to ask. Someone out there is going to wonder what it's worth. If the game is rare or out of print, note that. At that case, you may want to actually look up like the eBay going rate. So like, hey, this game goes for 200 bucks on eBay, gets people to bid. Now, when someone wins the item, all you're going to do is write down the winning bid price on the index card and give that card to the person who won. And then they sit back down. No changing money, no swapping games, none of that in the middle of the auction. At the end of the event, once you're all done, people bring up their cards, pay for the items, and then get them and go. Now, what I suggest is have a few volunteers, what I like to call runners, to help you with this. People who can run and hand out the cards and stuff like that and also hold up the games. Finally, if at all possible, accept digital money, accept credit and debit at your auction if at all possible. Now, for us, the local game store that we host the auction at, the CG Realm, has been fantastic and allows us to use their debit machine. And they're even cool enough to soak the fees for doing so, which is awesome on them. Now, in the States, this can be even easier as there are plenty more options like Stripe and other providers that will take electronic uh, funds out and about uh, portable right hooked up to your phone. But it is really important. Someone is just much more likely to spend big money from their account, especially when many people just don't carry that much cash with them these days. Yeah, that's another thing to push. Okay, before your event's happening, warn people to bring cash, right? If you're going to have raffles, draws, baked goods for sale, make sure people know that before they get to the event. So that's just a good generic tip that kind of goes with all of this. All right. Doing something special and charging for it is a great way to raise money. Now, what I mean by something special is something out of the ordinary, something you don't see at a regular game night, something you don't see at your local game store, something you don't see at a gaming cafe. If you're doing something unique like this, you can charge people money for it as long as it's going to charity. Well, you might be able to charge money for it normally, but that's a totally different topic. As an example, we recently had our Level Up for Extra Life charity RPG event here in Windsor. Like, there are role-playing game nights at the local game store, but this was a dedicated day of role-playing at the local game store. We had local game masters showing off games. We had some company support there. We even had a couple celebrities there. So we had Victoria Rogers of the Broadswords there. We had Terry Latorco, who works for Renegade Games, able to come out. And we just had local, some of the best DMs in the area running some hot games. And we just charged people five bucks each to play RPGs for the day. Yeah, never underestimate the ability of celebrities to draw in people to events. Even local celebrities can be draws. And when you've got big names in the gaming community, there can be plenty of options for fundraising. Even as simple as an autograph session for a small donation uh, is something that could add up. If you go to the Windsor event, you get to meet the tabletop bellhop. Come on. Now, another example of a special event is that the local Artemis crew is going to be set up at our Extra Life event in November and showing off the Artemis Starship Bridge Crew Simulator. If you haven't heard about this thing, it's basically a Star Trek LARP. Uh, they're going to be charging a small fee to play through a scenario, as well as offering some other incentive for players to donate. Now, not only is Artemis a great game, but it's a big draw, too. We talk about games that look great on the table. Well, imagine having... Five or six people all sitting around with computers and controllers working together to fly a spaceship. Yeah. That's just cool. And that is something that's going to appeal to any of your sci-fi fans. Now, another example. In October, I hosted an RPG book exchange. And what we did to raise money for that is we just charged a flat participation fee. 
Hundred percent of that fee went to extra life. Now at this event, this is an event where people bring in their old game books they're not using anymore and trade them with other gamers in the hope that they get stuff that they want or at least new stuff. Uh, we use a point based system, so it's not actual money changing hands, and that way it values the books at just relative value. It's a more abstract system to try to keep things fair. Now, besides raising some money for this event, it let players get rid of their old RPGs that have sat dusty on their shelves forever and bring something new home to check out. And gamers will often have a lot to trade if you give them the right push. Many of us are hoarders to a greater or lesser <laughs> degree, as the background of uh, the Bill Hobbs <laughs> will show you. Uh, and who knows who may want that thing you've been keeping for years, but aren't sure why you've been keeping it. Oh, heck, at the last one, I got a copy unpunched of Silent Death. I thought that was awesome. All right, another example of a special event. So at our event in November, the Hidden Trail Escape Rooms team will be offering a unique custom escape room experience at the CG Realm during our marathon. All of the money raised from that is getting donated to Extra Life. Uh, Brent's even got a volunteer to run the room for him who's not getting paid for the day, which is awesome. Personally, I am really looking forward to spending a few bucks on that one. Yeah, I've only been involved in big pro escape rooms to date, so I'm really interested in seeing what they have as a more portable option. Yeah, it's supposed to be like a 15-minute room, which is supposed to be so we can just keep rotating people in and out of it. <laughs> Five to eight people teams. It sounds really cool. Plus, Brent's been doing escape rooms in Windsor now for almost as long as we've been having extra life events. Excellent. And I can almost guarantee you we're going to have a big escape room up to eight people in the auction this year because Brent donated one every year. And if he hasn't yet, I'm going to poke him until he does. So. <laughs> Because I've gotten him to donate for six years. I think Deanna's correcting me there. I think it's been six years he's been running escape rooms here in Windsor. I think he's got like five or six different rooms now. Excellent. So basically, all, all this takes is some out-of-box thinking. You, you're just trying to come up with something special, something out of the ordinary, something that people would be willing to spend some money on that they that they wouldn't normally spend on a normal game night. I think about it, things like a paint and take miniature painting tutorial, or how about an intro to D and D session for brand new players? Whatever you can think of that you would be willing to spend money on or would have spent money on when you were new to the hobby, there's a good chance someone else is going to agree with you and want to spend money on that. All right. This is the, the big one. In my opinion, this is the one that tends to blow people's minds. Anyone who's been to our events, seen them many times, but one of the most successful things we have done to raise money for charity is let people cheat. Well, the auctions are what raise us the most money every year, but that's just because of volume. The cheat jars are in a very, very close second place. Like we raise thousands of dollars with people cheating during our charity gaming events. We encourage people to cheat. These events are meant to be fun. Raising money for a good cause. It's all about having fun and getting people to part with their money. We aren't worried about who wins or loses each individual game or who even who's winning overall or losing overall. That's why I have the Board Game Blitz tournament a couple weeks before our main event. If you want a competition to see who's the best gamer, show up to the tournament, raise some money that way. On the night of the event, during Extra Life, one of the most fun ways to get people to part with their cash to let them cheat. Out on the tables, at the store, we're going to have a number of cheat jars. They're just mason jars I got from Dollarama. I put some extra life branding on them, like I printed on my own printer, nothing fancy. With those, I put out sheets of paper with a bunch of suggested cheats. These cheats include a variety of things. For example, a buck, player can reroll a die, draw a new card, move an extra square, take one extra resource from the bank, and so on. For five bucks, you just pass that roll. You make that saving throw. Oh, you can just discard your hand and draw a new one. Or you know what? That miniature out in the middle of nowhere, he's got cover. I don't know where it came from, but he's got cover. Heck, for five bucks, take another turn, right? These are all suggestions, and we encourage players to come up with their own. Let's be honest. Especially at a 24-hour gaming session, odds will not always be in your favor. So have fun with it. Cheat to win. Cheat to lose. Cheat for a better story. It's all for charity. We even have players who aren't playing the games sometimes go by and cheat for other players or for the DM. It's fantastic. We have found the cheat jars to be particularly popular with RPGs, specifically RPGs with high character casualty expectations. Games like Paranoia and Dungeon Crawl Classics have raised us a ton of money over the years. But even with a standard game like Dungeons and Dragons, letting the players cheat does something unique to the game. It lets the DM ramp up the excitement and the difficulty level of their scenarios. And by doing that, you almost force the players to cheat, right? Like you make it a little extra hard. 
A charity gaming event is a great time to see if your D&D group can kill a Terrasque or take down Orcus. Extra fate point? No problem. Extra spell in your time of need? Sure thing. It's all just a donation away <laughs> and for a great cause. That makes it sound so much like microtransactions and <laughs> terrible. Don't let Wizards of the Coast listen to this episode or they're <laughs> going to start doing this for their organized play. Now, one thing. When you are allowing cheating, make sure everyone has buy-in. Make sure everyone participating buys in for the cheating. You want to encourage cheating. Like, seriously, everyone that walks in the door should be cheating. Every game that's played should ha allow cheating. But you know what? There are some more competitive gamers out there that want nothing to do with cheating. They want a fair fight. Tournaments are probably a place where you put the cheat jars away and not allow them. We do have a couple tournaments on our event going on on Saturday, Sunday that will not have cheating in them. Actually, I think we're, actually one might at least one tournament going on in the weekend is not going to have cheating. Instead, they're raising money by charging a participation fee. Fair enough. Just be sure everyone at the table is cool with cheating, but do that. The important thing we talk about session zero, we talk about pregame talk. We talk about cats and all that. This is the same thing before you start playing, make sure it's on the table and you know, now, the assumption at our events is they're cheating. So in my opinion, if you don't want cheating, bring that up before you start the game. While I'm not the most competitive gamer in the first place, you have to know your time. Tournaments where there are prizes for winning? Skip the cheap jar. Fun weekend of gaming for charity? Go on, throw your money in the jar and do that thing you've always wanted to do in the game. Now, finally, just to wrap up, one of the most important things to remember when you're having a special gaming event like this is that you are raising money for an important cause, whether that's extra life or some other charity. Remind players and participants why they're there. Encourage people to spend money. Point out where the money's going. Let them know that this is going for charity. This isn't just another game night. It's a charity game night. Everyone should be there to have fun, but you're also there to raise money for your cause. Have fun, but keep your eye on the prize. And last but not least, thank people. A lot. All the time. Thank sponsors, guests, players, hosts. Make sure you remind people that this is a great job everyone is doing for charity. You know what? I am going to take a moment right there and bring up our list of sponsors for our Windsor Extra Life event. I apologize for those of you having to listen to me type because I know it's close to the microphone. But Sean makes a good point there that I didn't have in the show notes he added. It's true. Thank people. Thank your volunteers. Thank the people organizing. Thank the venue for hosting you. Thank the person coming in and setting up escape rooms. Thank the people spending money. Thank the people bringing games. Thank the people who show up at 3 in the morning with a coffee. All of it. Let people know they are appreciated. Uh, and also, while Mo is typing, uh, just before we get into the lobby, I'm going to sort of jump in there a little early. Uh, Inch Games brought up uh, an important point is PR. Uh, letting, letting publicity, getting publicity out there, type up a little press, uh, a little press notice, send it out to your local, uh, media. If you've got a local TV station, if you've got a local radio station that does, uh, local events, get that out there. And, and, you know, it's charity. People are not mm -hmm. going to say, oh, it's a bunch of gamers. Ignore that. No, no, this is for charity. They will report. They may even send someone by. You may even get a spot yep. on the news. Yeah, we were putting a press release a little late this year. All right, so a huge thanks to all of the Windsor Extra Life sponsors. Here's your public shout-out. Uh, Tabletop L Up, that's us. Yeah, we're doing a lot of work for Extra Life this year. The CG Realm, that's our venue. That's where we're playing. They are doing so much for us, allowing us to have the space, staying open overnight, uh, donating the tips from the sandwich shop, stuff like that. Thank you. Tabletop Renaissance, MSI, Parallel Games, Albers Tool & Mold, Far Off Games, L.M. Clark, Chip Theory Games, Geek Life, Hidden Trail, ITS, Spartan Sling, Stronghold Games, First Frontier, Mind Clash Games, Level 99 Games, Atlas Games, Ares Games, Easy Mode, Red Raven, Weird City Games, Board Game Bliss, Leader Games, The Coffee Exchange, Green Feet Games, GMT Games, Garfield Games, Odd Bird, and the broadswords. Also, now, thank you to everyone who has helped get things set up this year. See you at the event. And now let's check back into the lobby. So we've had a lot of chat going on here, and I apologize awesome. to the people in the uh, chat room because there's no way we're going to get to everything people have talked about in here. Um, 
he well, hasn't copied any key parts for us. Uh, huh? So, oh, okay. so uh, one of the one of the issues people are running into, and, and you do always have to be cautious of, is uh, if you are going around and asking people for money for donations. Back when going back all the way to back to our gameathon concept, mm -hmm. um, do p pay attention. You know, especially in this day and age in the gig economy, where people are struggling desperately to you know pay their bills. Um, you know. Just be aware of who you're asking uh, money for. It may actually be almost easier to ask strangers when you know that that friend of yours just worked a uh, 20 hour shift so that they could buy groceries this week. Very fair. Um, Xanister brings up jumping jacks. Uh, you know, again, it's really important not to sit down for too long and not get up and move and, you know, and stay active during you know these what long, we should do? Uh, during events. the event, a couple times, we should like set an alarm and tell everyone. Hey, everyone stand up, stretch, get up, take a walk around. Might not be a bad idea. We could, we could do the Apple Watch thing at 10 minutes to the hour. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know what the Apple Watch thing is. But sure. 10, minute, 10 minutes to the hour, they, they remind you that you haven't gotten your 250 steps in yet. Oh, or whatever go. it is. Because um, I know Fitbit, Fitbit has the same option available. So it's just one of those reminders. It's like, hey, you haven't done anything mm -hmm. this hour. You should need to get some steps in. Yeah, um, press releases are important. Getting the word out. That's, to be honest, that's a totally different topic. We should talk about advertising your gaming events, whether it's charity or not. That that could be a whole thing. Flyers, uh, Facebook events. Uh, we don't recommend Meetup anymore. Uh, other online sources. Board Game Geek, that's somewhere I totally forgot about. Like, I'm running one of the biggest local game board game things of the year, and I didn't think to put it on Board Game Geek till last week. That's now there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, don't be afraid to take a nap. That's one I see many times. That's yeah. part of why we have the store open for 33 hours is if you do want to do the full 24, you can do 12 hours, go home, take a nap, get some sleep, come back, play the other 12. Yep. No, absolutely. There's a ton of different op uh, ways out there and it really is important to pay attention to your body and your health, uh, not rub Timbit flakes into your eyes, not, <laughs> you know, yeah. whatever, it, whatever it takes to make sure you're healthy. Uh, we've got some in the back of uh, Mo's picture there. We've got some of the uh, uh, QR codes available. Yep. So a quick and easy way to donate, easy to make up and print uh, so that people with their cell phone can walk up and, uh, you know, just scan the link and be right there ready to donate uh, to the cause. Uh, Here's a good little one. things like that. Good one for Extra Life from Danielle on our chat. Uh, take your extra Halloween candy. Bring it. Sell it cheap. Small and cheap. Sell it. Sell it. Give, pe give people five bucks a handful. If yeah, I mean, if if you're gaming for twenty four hours, you aren't going to bat an eye at, at you know pumping some extra sugar into you. Yes. To, to keep going. Uh, some people were talking about uh, what they called Chinese auctions, which is you buy raffle tickets yeah, and you put the raffle tickets into uh, raffle into buckets. Um, and 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 some are suggesting that you know that that may be right for a certain audience and possibly not gamers. Um, I to be honest, that is what one local store did last year and managed to raise $300. Now, yeah. based on the amount of product they seem to have in, I think that was a losing proposition for them. Not like they donated it. They're not losing anything, but it, it didn't, they didn't seem to get the value for it. Yeah. It's one of those things where, um, you have to want to donate to the event and not care as much about the auction. Uh, one of the reasons it works with, uh, you know, like church groups and stuff like that, these people are going to give money to the church money yeah. to anyway. So they just buy a bunch of tickets and, and then they throw some things in the buckets because they want them. Whereas a lot of the cases for our auctions, this is stuff people want. They want to bid on that. They want to spend money on that thing or there's nothing they want to spend money on. Yeah. Um, and so they're hesitant to just throw some money in uh, and not but when, when they aren't necessarily sure in advance what they're going to be bidding on. Um, There's a, another tip. This is one we I personally prefer to reward people who are actually participating too. So if you're doing door prizes, I like to hand them out to people who are playing games instead of just everyone who walks in the door. Uh, but that's just me because it's an extra life gaming event. I want people to game. We usually do draws by using here's a, here's an interesting hack. If you don't want to do raffle tickets, take two decks of cards and keep, have them sorted in order and hand everyone out a card. And then when you do that, you pull another card out of the other deck and then you can shuffle your second deck to draw. And that'll give you a random person out of everything you had the first time. Uh, the other thing you can do is that way everyone can only win once because when they win something, they hand the card back in. That's a trick we've been doing for 10 years, at least for local events. That's something I, I think it's Knights of Columbus thing. My parents learned. But I only give cards to people who play games. So if you're just going to kind of go around and like, great, buy some baked goods and it's awesome you came out to support us. But part of it, it's a gaming marathon. Play some games. Now, one thing Dee brought up in the chat room is uh, bringing a float. 
So uh, starting yeah. starting bank, uh, Major Kayla was saying is another term uh, in, in Canada. I've or at least in Ontario, I've always heard it as float, and that's the money yeah. you need to sort of get get everything going and to give change. It is really important to have that and not just a little bit, because if you're running a bake sale and an auction and cheat jars and all these other things, uh, you can really run into some, you know, if everyone shows up with $20 bills and yep. wants to spend $1 here and $1 here, you need a way to enable that. So <laughs> it's really important to have that float or a starting bank available uh, right there from the get go, you know, plan ahead, go to the bank, get your rolls of quarters or dollars or whatever it is you need, uh, and be prepared to make change right away. Yeah. And a shout out to Jeff in the chat. He is the DCC. I don't know what's DCC called their game masters. I don't remember GM who, uh, I think raised the most money at our extra life tournament last year. I'm not sure if he beat out the D and D table that played for 28 hours straight. It and, was and is and Jeff is, if, if for anyone reading our chat room, a big supporter of the cheat jar. Yes. Uh, and considering running a higher level module for low level characters where you have to cheat to win. Exactly, right? That's that's the kind of thing you do, right? That's that's why you can do it. He did beat out the D&D table. See, yeah. I couldn't remember. The D&D table did really well. Um, they did really good at our level up event. So they're going to be back. Judge, thank you. Judge, I, I so should have known that, Judge. I knew, I knew it wasn't the M. <laughs> All right, so that is this has been an awesome chat room today. Thank yep. you very much for everyone who uh, jumped in. But that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhog. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. Uh, if you got a question for us, just again, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more with several things in the works, so now's the time to get in on the ground floor. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out a newsletter email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous, which right now is six YouTube videos a week blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now, join the Bellhop team Thursday night, 9 p.m. on Twitch at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Now, we're inviting you to join us for this weekly chance for the three of us to do some online gaming together, to hang out, basically. It's uh, the three of us hang out, we play some games. Now, lately, uh, we haven't been doing tabletop games. We've been doing Star Wars The Old Republic, but we have been known to preview some Kickstarters or read the occasional FAQ. Now, next Wednesday, or tomorrow, for those of you listening to the podcast, when it drops, will be our October AMA. That's right. The week after Extra Life, I don't have to write a blog post. That's fantastic. The last Wednesday of every month, we're going to be here on Twitch answering your questions live. We're hoping to see record numbers here live, but feel free to send in your questions ahead of time to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. All right. If you're listening to this the day it comes out, it's the week before Extra Life. For the rest of you, it's a week and a half away. We've talked about this charity gaming event over the enough, enough over the last few weeks. So at this point, I just want to invite everyone one last time to join us on November 2nd uh, and into November 3rd. Uh, join us live at the CG Realm here in Windsor from 10 a.m. Saturday, 6 p.m. Sunday. Play games, buy baked goods, try the escape room, cheat, have fun. Or join us here live on Twitch where we'll be streaming all the gaming going on down in Windsor. I wonder if you can live stream the escape room. <laughs> and see if you get us if you escape. We got to figure that out. You get, get all three of us in there and we'll embarrass the heck out of ourselves. <laughs> Wonderful allowed to cheat in the escape room for a loony. Yeah. Up next, a look at an escape room in a box game. Exit the game, the secret lab. All right, see, as we just had a great transition, I have to call it out and ruin it as a great transition because that's what you do on podcasts because that was totally unplanned. <laughs> all right, escape rooms are becoming more and more of a big deal around the world. Uh Along with that popularity has come a wide variety of tabletop escape room games. 
Uh, basically, an escape room you can play at home. Now, today I'm going to look at one of these escape room board games, Exit the Game, The Secret Lab. Now, this is actually my first time playing any of these boardroom escape room games. Now, uh, I don't think there's any spoilers here. The only thing I'm going to spoil in this is I'm going to give you the setup, which is the first thing you read in the rule book. So I'm not spoiling any of the actual puzzles. So now this is an interesting concept for me because I feel like the immersion is part of what makes uh, the escape room special. And yeah. this game relies on a smart little cardboard box of puzzles to do that. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, exit the, the Secret Lab, I think all the Exit games, so I could be wrong about that. At least this one was designed by Inca and Marcus Brand. Features art by Inca Brand, Marcus Brand, Sylvia Chinstoff, I apologize for my pronunciations, and Franz Volwinkel. Isn't it's that Christoph? It. Christoph, yes, it would be. Sylvia Christoph, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it was published in 2016 by Cosmos Games or Thames and Cosmos. Now, opening up the Secret Lab, like Sean said, it's a small box really small uh there's a short rule book another rule book that the first rule book warns you not to look at um two thin cardboard punch boards like really thin and two stacks of cards which also had big warnings on you telling them not to look at them or touch them uh the final con component in the box is one of those clue wheels that man i'm totally 80s zork flashback there that i figured i was wasn't sure if i had an anti-piracy thing or a puzzle piece uh, the Great Secret Code Wheel, a fun puzzle stable since the secret code rings ordered by mailing in the bottoms of cereal boxes. Yes. Now, these games uh, are tiny. They're not that expensive. And the components were pretty much what I expected. Uh, the game's pretty much made up of cards, though interesting isn't a card game at all. You're not playing cards. You never shuffle. You never draw a hand or anything like that. Uh, the cardboard punch out's rather thin, but you know what? It worked for what it was, and I'm not going to tell you what it was. Uh, the cards are very good quality. Like, these are nice, solid cards. Uh, I think there's a linen finish on them. Artwork was fine. I, it was good. It, it fit the theme. The instructions are 99% clear, almost perfect. The only thing that I did find missing was that nowhere did it tell you to punch out the punch boards, like the, the punch board that comes with it. Now, I admit, it's pretty obvious. you got a punch board. You punch it. But just with how literal the game is about everything else, because it is a puzzle, I did think it was odd that it was omitted from the rulebook that said, hey, before you start, punch out the punch boards. And to be fair to the game, this game is very inexpensive. So quality components are going to be limited. It's kind of impressive they got what they did. Now, the instructions are written so you read them as you play the game for the first time. So there's no prep here. You sit down, open the box, and read it. Um, starts off with setup. The setup in this is you apply for a job at a lab. You're answering a thing in a paper. And once you get there to test some drugs, you wake up. You're drugged. There's like a, a, a test tube starts bubbling stuff. And you pass out. You wake out in a locked room. You have to solve a series of rizzles in order to get out. Note, there's no actual lock here, and there's no actual time limit except for end scoring. So it's not quite the same thing of being locked in a physical room. Now, getting the game ready to play is very simple. You take the two sets of cards, and you split them into a bunch of decks. There's two main decks. One's riddles, which are sorted alphabetically, A through whatever. And then the answer cards, which are sorted numerically, one through whatever. Now, there's also another number of clue decks, and in this case, there's 10 of them, and those are sorted by symbol. Each of these clue decks has three cards in them except one. The game also came with what they called tools. These are things that were on the punch boards, and there have to be two of them in this game. And you're told to leave those in the box until you're told to get them out. Now, there's also this pamphlet that you get access to right from the start. The last thing, then, is the code wheel that you just keep on hand that you use whenever you think you've solved one of the riddles. Now, you mentioned first time, but this is a one-and-done game, which yeah. is part of the reason for its low cost. It's not designed to be replayable. No, not at all. And you know what? I'm going to address that at the end of the review. I want to yeah. talk specifically about the replayability of this and the claim that it can be replayable. I just want to, I, I dropped that in there. I, I know we're going to talk yeah. about it later, but because you did talk about playing it the first time, I wanted yeah. to sort of slip there, there that in there. There is only a first time. We yeah. played it. Um, now, the pamphlet very clearly leads you to the first clue. Pretty much. Um your first riddle, whenever you get a riddle, whenever you get a clue, you're going to flip over the appropriate riddle card and do what it says. This should lead you to a three-digit number by solving the card. If you can't figure out how to get this number, you can then draw from those clue decks. Now, I mentioned the clue decks are three cards. Well, the first one 
just tells you what you would have had to unlock and have found to solve it. So it just, do you have everything available to even solve this yet? Because there's some of the riddles that can't be solved until you solve other ones, right? Like a big chain. Uh, the next clue is going to give you a hint. The third clue gives you the solution and how you should have gotten to the solution. So this is very much, for those of you who may not have had the chance, like a real escape room, but without the underpaid teenager giving you clues <laughs> over a static-filled radio. Now, once you have your three-digit number, you're going to use the code wheel and enter it. Uh, this is going to give you another number that tells you which answer card to draw. Now, this answer card is going to tell you you're wrong or lead you to do one more lookup. That's pretty simple. But again, I don't want to spoil anything because I don't know if any of the other exit games are different. And that'll get you one final answer card that's going to tell you, yes, you did it or not. If you did it, that's going to then unlock more riddle cards from the riddle deck or tell you you won the game. Right. So I, the, the one thing about this game that I find interesting is that you understand from the start how many riddles there are. Yes. And that's one of the, and that's one of the benefits I find of a real escape room, uh, where I, if you get into the more evolved escape rooms, you are always hoping that that next puzzle is going to be the last. Whereas in this game, the way you've laid it out, you pretty much know how many puzzles yeah. you've got. Yeah, it's very clear, right? In the rule book, it tells you too. Oh, okay. Like you also know by the number of clue decks, but it yeah, tells it's you. the, the clue decks games, was the... And I don't know, uh, like this one, the Secret Lab has ten puzzles. I have no idea if every exit game has ten puzzles. I have no clue. Um, so once you fit beat the puzzles, there's a score sheet on the back of the rule book where you fill it out. Uh, this is going to be based on how long you took. So this is where we found out that really the time limit is two hours. Like, to, to get the max score, you could do even better. But, like, if, if you do longer than two hours, it's kind of like a bad score. Uh, you're also going to get scored based on how many of the clue cards you had to use. And to be fair, this is actually more puzzles than some paid escape rooms offer. Ten puzzles is, is a pretty good hunk of, of, yeah. of games to play. So that's the basic premise, like how it works. Now, as for the actual gameplay experience, I guess I started off a bit rough. First off, having never played one of these, we had no idea what we were looking for when getting the first clue. While I can't be certain, now that we know the flow of how an exit game works, I have a feeling that every exit game would now go quicker for us. Just how you know what to put in the clue wheel took a eureka moment for us. And now that's one thing I see pretty regularly about this game is player count. And this is actually my experience in real escape rooms as well. Um, well, BGG states two as the best player count, uh, if you look into their numbers, again, if you can always click on that and, and see some of the math behind it and looking elsewhere outside of BGG, I see a lot of recommendations for three to four players. Now, if this is the, this is key, if it's the first time you've done an escape room, having either more people or someone who is experienced with escape rooms in general goes a long way. That if, if you have a, a, a group of eight people who've never mm -hmm. done an escape room in an escape room, it's hilarious to watch <laughs> them flail around having no clue even what sort of thing they're supposed to be looking at. Whereas if you've right. got one person in there who can help guide people in the right direction, everything just flows more smoothly. Yeah, like I said, there, there's one thing that we found we had to look for, and knowing that changed our whole perspective. Right. Like Deanna noted in the chat, she's certain she wasted way too much time staring at the props and not focusing on the riddles. Everything in this is the riddles. Right. Now, another thing that took us way too long, and it was literally the first step, was identifying something in a picture. Now, you do this a lot, and you probably do it in all the other exit games just based on the format, because I don't know what else you'd be able to do with cards in a booklet. And the problem wasn't that the clue wasn't obvious, it's that it was small. Deanna and I are both in our 40s, and this means our eyesight is not what it used to be. And we spent a lot of time staring at an obvious clue, trying to figure out what number was on it, only because it was so small. Now, this was an ongoing issue playing through the Secret Lab. The text on the cards is small. The images on the cards are even worse. The symbols and the images are small. It's bad enough that once we got home, uh, we ended up having to split up the gaming night on this one. We brought out a magnifying glass. Well, uh, sadly, uh, we're getting old and uh, it sucks, but that's the facts. Yeah. And as Deanna <laughs> points it out, that's it. There's the clue. It's right there. What the heck is that? Yeah. Right? Like that was the point we were stuck at. Yeah. It wasn't a puzzle that we got stuck at. Yeah. 
Now, getting to the actual riddles, I said there were 10 different riddles. They're all quite clever. Uh, None of them were overly simple, uh, where, like, you just looked at it and got it. Didn't happen. But none were really hard enough to stump us. Uh, We finished our game only using one clue, and we only used that one really reluctantly. I got to admit, there was one puzzle, a couple puzzles we got stuck on for a while, but given enough time, we solved them all. We were probably a little more stubborn than we should have been. Like, we probably, at one point, we did use a clue just to confirm we had unlocked everything we needed. And yes, we did. So we were good there. Um, The riddles themselves are a mix of logic puddles, pattern recognition, reading comprehension, deductive reasoning, process of elimination. There was pretty much the gamut there. there was drawing, tracing, and so on. I have to say I was impressed by the variety of different puzzles. And it's definitely good to hear that they didn't sort of dig in and stick to anything too narrow just to hang themselves on that theme, a secret lab. So let's, you know, keep to a certain theme and and, and yeah. move in that direction, uh, you know, to hear the fact that they, you know, spread it out and you had, you know, a variety of 10 different uh, puzzles to work on is, is good to hear. Actually mentioning the theme, they did a really good job of sticking to the theme in ways. Um, like there were, there were, chemistry based things in many of the puzzles but not all right again i don't want to give anything away now the other problem we did have though uh was that these puzzles mostly being on cards and in a book was the fact it was hard for two of us to work on at once they had often felt like one of us was doing the work and the other was looking over the other shoulder um like Again, Board Game Geek recommended this with two, and I think this is the main reason why. Like, I can see this being a bigger problem with more than two players. If we had had a regular group of five, because I had originally bought this to bring out on a Monday night cream, I think three of us would have been sitting there waiting for something to do or waiting to be past the puzzle, because we wouldn't have been able to do it all at once. Uh, Yeah, so this is a big issue with a puzzle box versus an actual escape room. Uh, you can't explore the other aspects and prepare for what might be next or examine other avenues. There's just that one item to be staring at. And I apologize to the people in the chat room who are confused. I fixed it. I'm sorry. Moving on. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I will admit there were points where we had multiple riddle cards out at once. So there were a couple times where we could each be working on something, but most of the time, though, it was trying to, trying to, to, to figure out one puzzle. Now, we also did run into an actual misprint of a card. Now, that misprint totally confused us, though in the end, it didn't actually have an impact on solving the puzzles. Uh, If anything, it sent us off in the wrong direction for a while. Now, that card was a clue card, and there's a chance you'll never see it if you pick this up. But if you have an early printing of the Secret Lab, it is worth looking up for an errata, which is sad. You never have to do that. Note, this doesn't make the riddle unsolvable, and it doesn't ruin the game, but it's going to confuse the heck out of you. Yeah, there. Uh, this is called out actually boldly on the main Board Game Geek page of the game that the first printing has an error. So they've obviously realized that this is a horrible thing because it's not too often you see errata on the front page. First thing you see almost on a game. Yeah, it's it's bad. <laughs> yeah, like it's uh, it's a translation issue. Yeah. But overall, Deanna and I had fun. Um, We scored six stars out of ten, which I think is pretty good for our first time playing one of these games ever. Um, I was extremely impressed by the ingenuity of the game. Just the the way it worked, right? Like the way they managed to use these various decks of cards and how clever the code wheel actually works and how you look up clues without it spoiling anything. Uh, Though, there's just... There was something missing. I don't know. Maybe it's the fact that it was just a bunch of cards and it wasn't a physical escape room, like Sean said. I've never done a physical escape room, so I can't compare the two. Hope to do one in November. Uh, I just wanted something more. I don't know what. Uh, Despite that, though, it was a fun way to kill a couple hours. I think it was a good, fun experience, but wasn't amazing. Like, I had people have kind of raved about these style of games and how they've, they've broken what board games are. There's a whole new experience. I didn't get that big wow factor. So this game actually comes up as a good first choice because one of the others in the series is apparently much better. And people have commented that moving to this game after playing the other one is a bit of a letdown. So uh, what I've heard is the exit the game, the abandoned cabin is a notably superior game. Now, I don't know for what reasons. I don't even actually understand. Mm. You know, I don't know why, (laughs) but a lot of people have said that it sort of, I, I, it seems like you get that some of the immersion is a little better. 
Okay. Um, so uh, people are saying, you know, the, because of the, the, you know, the theme of the puzzles and things, there is some immersion in this one. And you can yeah. get yourself sort of, you know, hooked or in that thought space. Uh, but again, ab- apparently exit the game. The abandoned cabin is the better. Okay. I want to talk a bit about the destruction of components and the exit the game series of board games. One of the most controversial aspects of the Exit series of games from Cosmos is that they're one and done. Not only can you only play it once because you solved all the puzzles, but the physical copy of the game can only ever be played once by anyone. That's because while playing the game, you end up marking up, damaging, and destroying the physical components. Yeah, so a legacy game, but without any legacy except recycling. Now, many blogs out there are going to tell you, you don't have to destroy anything to play one of these games. I want to swear here because I I don't agree. I want to call gaming and BS on that. Um, Well, I guess it's technically possible. You could make the game replayable without destroying anything. It's going to require you to basically duplicate the game. You're going to have to make duplicates of a bunch of the components in the game in order to preserve the originals. Like, sure, you could use paper and take notes for certain puzzles. That's fine. But other ones literally require you to cut up or fold components. And unless you're going to exactly duplicate those components somehow, like tracing them, drawing them out, photocopying them or something, you're going to end up making your copy of the game unplayable. And yes, I've seen a couple people out there saying, my visual acuity is good enough that I can do it without having to cut and I can just picture it. I Sure, maybe. Good on you. That's not going to be the average gamer. Yeah, so and in duplicating and preparing the game for replay, you'd by necessity spoil it. So you would need a third party to do it for you, which is just getting way out of hand. Yeah, I, like these games are cheap, right? They're they're 50 bucks US MSRP. You can usually even find that, them cheaper that's 15, online. 15, not 50. 15. <laughs> Sounded, just, just to clarify there. Yeah. One five US MSRP, and they can usually found cheaper. You can find package deals. Uh, I just don't think it's worth the time and effort to make a replayable copy. I personally took the staples out of the booklet because then we could hand out the pages. I, I literally took the book apart. We folded things. We cut things. We traced things. I used pens and paper and pencils. Uh, I used a card as a ruler to do something because it needed a straight edge, which actually ruined the edge of the card. Like, no one's ever going to play my copy of the Secret Lab again. It's literally in my recycle bin outside. Should be going out, I think, tomorrow. If not tomorrow, a week for tomorrow. Like, if you're going to buy an exit game, just know going in, that it's meant to be written on, folded, cut up, and destroyed. It's all part of the experience. Yeah, so uh, as uh, as D just pulled up right now, we've got a link in the chat room. It's under $10 on Amazon right now. Is that for the Secret Lab specifically? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was, I, I checked, when I checked earlier today, it was like nine ninety eight or something like that for, for the Secret Lab. Um, you know, it's it's really, really cheap. And it, it's probably worth noting at this point, like I would have disclosed at the beginning of this that this was a review copy. This isn't. I bought this. I bought this game. So it, this is not one of those cases where Cosmo sent me a copy of the game. This is, I, I paid for it and tore it up. Of course, yeah, I think everyone everyone knows that I do that with my Gloomhaven too. So if I'm willing to do it with a hundred and fifty dollar game, I might as well do it with a fifteen. dollar Jeff is game. saying the price of a three D cinema ticket. I think it's actually cheaper than that that I can get a three D cinema ticket for. But you know, yeah. again, you're 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 gonna get you know for however many people you play with, you're getting you know an two hour bucks. or two two hours of, of gameplay for ten bucks. That's pretty good. I mean, you can't get a couple of Starbucks coffees for that. So. Yeah, the most expensive thing of this was probably the cappuccino and the coffee we bought on the night we were going to play the game. So, All right. And now, the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played and the events we attended and other cool gaming stuff that's been going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. All right, so Monday night was Thanksgiving, and that's actually when Deanna and I played The Secret Lab. Now, the only thing notable here that I haven't already mentioned about the game is that we found a decent new coffee shop called Chow Coffee that sadly closed early because it was Thanksgiving, even though I made 
check to make sure they were open. So it made us have to pack up the game partway through. Now, here's one thing I didn't mention in the review. You really don't want to break up that experience. You want to play it straight through. Like, set a good two hours. Yeah. They, so that's a lesson learned. Like, if we do this again, we're going to make sure we go to a coffee shop at noon, not at 10 at night, knowing the, or 9 at night, knowing they close at 11. And, and honestly, I'm not even sure a coffee shop is a great idea for this because, again, part of the whole concept of the escape room is that immersion. And it's it's tough to kind of really get your head sunk into that game if you're in a public space. Um, that I guess, my, I don't know. I don't know. Being away from the kids and my mom was much easier well, to focus on the game. Than fair <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. Fair yeah. enough. I guess if you've got enough distractions at home to keep you, uh, keep you out of the headspace, then maybe, maybe the coffee shop is better. So your mileage may vary. I'm better at ignoring the, the, the public than my family. That's all that <laughs> is. <laughs> All right, so the other big event that happened this past weekend was a horror Halloween-themed game night at Easy Mode, the eSports Lounge. Um, I'm a huge fan of themed game nights. Like, in general, I would rather be a, at or host a themed game night than an open game night. Uh, there are a few reasons for this. One of them being that it helps me filter down my game collection. We talked about this when our Picking Games segment of... Uh, a few episodes back. It uh, lets me limit what I have to choose from. I got a lot of games to pick from, but if I go down there and I'm only looking for superhero games, that's a lot narrower list. Um, the other reason, though, is that they tend to make the game night special. We talked about this earlier when trying to raise money, right? It's not just another game night. It's pirate night or it's superhero night or it's horror-themed game night. This tends to help out with attendance. It's always been our themed events that get the best attention. And frankly, I added bonus. I just think it's kind of fun to play a bunch of games that have a similar theme in a row, a similar and style. It's also helpful to get people uh, in a mindset. So, you know, if you're going out to a game night, you don't know what you want to play. Maybe you're not sure. But if you're going to a superhero game night, you have a mindset. And let's be honest, a lot of geeks are really into <laughs> role playing, even if they're going to play board games. So mm -hmm. you might get cosplayers coming out. Yep. Why not? You know, because it's fun and you know what you know what you're getting into. So this past Saturday, at easy mode, uh, all of these things were a factor. Uh, I had fun picking out spooky and horror themed games to play. We had the best attendance we've had yet at easy mode. And as far as I can tell, everyone had a great time. Were there anyone in costume? No, no one uh, in costume. I don't think we did a great job of advertising that it was a Halloween night that we could have done better. So I, I think that was part of it. Now, I started off the event teaching games. Actually, I spent the entire event mostly teaching games this time. Uh, but it was teaching them to gamers I'd never met before, which was awesome. Now, I was along with Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton. Um, and the two of us, well, actually, Sean had never played it before. Uh, we played Monster Factory. Now, this is an easy-to-learn and play tile-laying game from Mayfair. Uh, to be honest, this comes from my kids' game collection. But this is a game I find adults dig. And while building monsters is just good for a Halloween theme, right? It fits that theme. Uh, this game, you're drafting tiles, you're building monsters. The tiles are different cr creepy, gro gross, goofy body parts. Uh, the edges are either open, have a skinny green part or a thick purple part. And you, all, of course, have to match them and try to build a complete monster. Once you finish your main monster, you can start building minions. And what's neat is your main monster is just worth as many points as tiles it took. Your minion only scores points for the number of eyes on its tiles, which I thought was a cute thematic thing. It's a silly, simple game, but it actually does have some skill because the one key rule, the killer app, is that when you draw a tile, you can play it on your monster or someone else's. So that's the neat bit of, oh, man, do I make his harder? Do I try to do mine? And so on. We had so much fun with Monster Family. We actually played three games in a row. And while we were playing, different players swapped in and out. So that was, it went over way better than I thought it would. So you just have to remember, again, this this is a aimed at a kids or family game. It's not, a, it's not a weighty game. Um, and, and there are some, you know, it's not a gamer's game. But no. for a thematic event, that doesn't necessarily matter. And that's yep. that's one of the keys here is that when you're doing a themed event, you're looking to get people into that mood. And sometimes mm -hmm. fun, silly games are just what the doctor ordered. 
Yeah, it's one of those, like, to be honest, it went over that well, and that's what the people were in the mood for, right? Like, that set the tone by, by playing Monster Factory first and with these new gamers. Like, these gamers were, were video gamers, easy modes and eSports lounge. They were advertising the event, and they got some other, I don't know what these people play, Fortnite players, we'll say. They, they could have been League of Legends players, whatever. These video gamers come out to their board game event. These are not people who knew hobby board games. So after they enjoyed Monster Factory, I stuck to lighter games for most of the night, and I broke out King of Tokyo next. Uh, first game, five players, um, which was pretty cool. Um, this was their their first experience with something a little bigger than Yahtzee. And King of Tokyo was pretty much always a hit with new gamers. And it didn't fail me Saturday. Our mixed group of tabletop and video gamers had a great time playing. Uh, we actually ended up playing twice. The second, I threw in King of Tokyo Power Up, which is the, the gamer's expansion that makes it more of a gamer's game. And we had another player to the group, so we got up to six players. And I got to say, this sold the game to the video gamers. Like, I'm, maybe here's where they're League of Legends players, because, man, they love the idea that their characters could evolve. Uh, of course, they're making Pokemon references, but it was like, oh, if I roll three hearts, my monster evolves. They really dig that. Uh, I got to say, these guys love this game so much that if Easy Mode sold games, we would have sold a copy of King of Tokyo and the expansion right then and there. Well, that's that's awesome to hear. Uh, and it's interesting because, again, I, my experience with King of Tokyo, I mean, with the Powers expansion, was with a big table, I, I didn't really enjoy it personally. So it's awesome to hear that uh, it uh, it worked for them. Yeah, we did cheat, though. We played with more players than the game allows when we played it on New Year's that one night. That's true. And I think that that was a bad idea, to be honest. I was trying to include everyone, and I should have <laughs> stuck to the listed player count. So at this point, we had six players all playing together. We split up. Uh, one of the, Another local gamer showed up, Sebastian. Uh, he was really hot to play a game called Ghost Stories. It's a brutally hard cooperative game. Uh that is put out by Asmodee. He took these these video gamers and like, I'm going to show you something new, right? So he went off and did that, and that left Sean and I. I uh, kind of looked around. There were other people were all playing games, and we decided to play Sorcerer. Now, Sorcerer, for a horror-themed game night, just look at the art. Like, it may not be what comes to your mind right away, but man, that game's got some creepy art. Uh, it's been a few weeks since I played Sorcerer, and I'm happy to say I still remember how to play. That was nice. Uh, Sean had played before, again, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, uh, had played a couple times in our four-player games we had done at the CG Realm, so he kind of knew the game. So it was nice to be able to jump right in. It was also cool because we knew the decks a little better. So, like, instead of randomly picking or anything, like, I knew what I wanted to play and he knew what he wanted to play, so that was cool. So we we strategically picked our three decks. That was neat. Um game was good. Uh, it was not only fun, but tight, like really tight. Game came down to a final fight for the middle battleground, which Sean should have won, but I was able to delay for one round. I had basically summoned Cthulhu. I don't remember its name. And the battlefield was exhausted, so you don't resolve it, which gave me first attack next round, because then I was first. Had Sean gone first, he needed one crit to win. That's it. Any one of his monsters got one crit, it was over. With me going first, I just had to do five total damage before he got that one crit. Dice were with me, and I managed to win the game. That was the most enjoyable and closest game of Sorcerer I played yet. Well, that, that's great to hear because I mean we've had some we've had some misses on that game, but uh, you know it's good to hear that you know coming back to it after a little while, you know getting some separation from all those earlier plays that mm -hmm. were they're more for review. Um, that it's still just a, a fun game when you play it with the right number of people. Yeah, with two people, with two people, four, four people was okay, but two's two's the sweet spot. Yeah. Now, while we were playing Sorcerer, we were joined by Kui. Uh, it's someone who was at our board game Blitz tournament. People recognize him. He came in fourth. Um, with him joining and knowing he liked more strategic games, I started to, to move into a little heavier stuff. So I borrowed a friend's copy of Dungeons and Dragons Tyrants of the Underdark. I don't know. Drow, horror, Halloween, maybe, I guess. I don't know. This one might have been pushing it, but hey. Um, that gamer was Justin, um, who had only recently bought the game, and it wasn't even punched. Personally, I love the lonely fun of punching games. I, that is something I enjoy doing by myself in the basement with Netflix on in the background. Uh, thankfully, Justin is a little less neurotic with his games than me and was cool with us opening his game for him. There are probably people out there listening to this right now cringing at yeah. the thought of someone else I know. punching their game. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I sometimes I'll let people help, but no... As for Tyrants of the Underdark, it continues to impress me. Like, I, every time I play, it's, it's better and better. I, I see more depth of the game. Uh, we played a three-player game. Um, 
I would have liked to have played four players, but at that point, everyone was playing something. Like, just to note some of the other games going on. Abomination, the era of Frankenstein. You're in, like, old London trying to build a, a, a Frankenstein's monster. That looked like a really neat game. Uh, Sebastian was still doing ghost stories. And there was a large group of casual gamers who had showed up. Uh, they were doing some kind of writing-based party game that they were laughing their butts off. So... That just left Q, Sean, and I. So Q had never played before, but he's familiar with a wide variety of deck building games and played folk on a map games, right? You get an experienced gamer here, so the teach went well. I thought for sure I had this game. Um, I had a great promotion-based strategy going, but I missed how quickly Q was getting troops out onto the battlefield. Like, it was insane. The game ended, like, I, like, I wouldn't say two turns early. It was like 10 turns early. It was like game was just over like i'm sitting there doing my strategy and i'm promoting stuff but i'm promoting basic cards at this point trying to clear my deck and then i look over and q's got like three troops left and he's got like six different play six troop cards like i'm like oh my god so i hurt because i only promoted the weak stuff instead of promoting the big stuff so i i kind of failed on that overall though it was great uh it's not just me that digs it q had never played it before and he pointed out at the end that he thinks it may be the best deck builder he's ever played Wow, that's quite the uh, quite the comment. And welcome, Trash Aroma. Thanks for joining us. Uh, up next, I got the kids' games out again. Uh, for I don't even know why. I wanted to stick the theme. I think that was part of it. Was like we played Tyrants, and I wanted to stick the theme. Uh, one of the games I brought was Coast Fighting Treasure Hunters. Um, this was the same group of players who just played Tyrants of the Underdark. And I got to admit, the look on Q and Sean's face when I brought this Mattel's game out, like, this is a kid's game from Mattel. And they went, wow, the board looks like Clue. And actually, Sean Hamilton made a good point. He's like, no, I recently played another game that looked like Q that was way more fun than I thought. And he was alluding to um, Cypress Legacy. So he was willing to give it a shot. Q, though, kind of gave me a sideways <laughs> glance. I, now, I haven't played Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters for a while, so I did have to do a cre quick refresh on the rules. Uh, it doesn't take long. They're about four pages. Um, it was mostly set up. We started playing, and man, that game plays smooth. Like, in this game, you're playing kids who are sneaking into a haunted mansion to steal eight gems. And it's it's cooperative. You're working together. You're fighting the ghosts. Your monsters are spawning. It's just a neat game. And Sean and Q both loved it. Like, we played once, and we lost on easy, and then we played again with, with the advanced rules that add the complication of having to find the gems in order. Wow. And doors locking. Oh, my God, Sean Hamilton has the worst luck ever. As soon as he got in front of a door, it would lock. And then the nasty draw three new ghosts, then shuffle. Like, it was, we lost both times. But, man, it was so much fun. Like, this still reaffirms my, my thought. I honestly believe Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters is the best kids game ever made. And this is three, I don't know, I guess you could call us hardcore gamers. People who play a lot of games that had a great time laughing out loud. People coming by, what are you guys playing? We had Justin, who's playing the Abomination game, getting distracted, right? Like, he was like, what's going on? It is such a great game. Yeah, no, they were, and they're pointing out it, it, it won Kinderspiel in, in 2014. Yeah. Uh, also, I, you know, I love the game. I've, I've played it. I've, uh, it was fantastic. And it's fun for, it's fun for adults. It's fun for kids and it's fun for adults with kids. Yes. Uh, it really does have this great universal appeal. Um, it's, you know, we call it a silly game, but it's got a seven one on BGG. Yeah. I mean, this is seven not a game Mattel. with a lot of, a lot of hate and what we need to get our hands on. There are two expansions for it. Two now I knew about one and there, there are two expansions and they're actually well rated too. There is seven, five and an eight one for the newest one. The, uh, the Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters Creepy Cellar expansion that just came out last year yeah. is, is over eight. Um, wow. Yeah, it, it just hasn't been on sale. That's <laughs> the main reason I haven't picked it up. So at this point, we played, we finished Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. I was good to go. I was like, all right, what are we playing next? And then Sean pointed out it was already 1030. And the event runs until 10. So that's something I've always done with my events. My events run from 5 till 10. But easy mode is open till 2 a.m. And people are welcome to hang around and stay. And what was neat this week is, like, despite I was leaving, there were a lot of people who were staying till 2 to play more games, which is pretty cool. So it's good to say that. Uh, overall, it was a fun game night. Uh, it was probably one of the best nights we've had at easy mode yet. And I hope the trend of getting more people out gaming and gaming later continues. All right. So uh, how about look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? 
All right. Well, this Saturday, again, this only really matters for those of you in the chat room. Uh, it's another spooky, spooky, spooky. I don't know what spooky, spooky means. <laughs> spooky themed game night. Uh, this time we're at the CG realm. Um, there I am going to be doing demos of Dead Man's Cabal, playing necromancers who want to go to a party. So you got to resurrect some guests. A uh, very unique game from Pandasaurus Games. I'll be showing that off, but there'll be other creepy, goofy games there. I'll make sure to bring Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. But the big thing, and the big thing everyone's heard us talk about a million times, and there's good reason for it, our biggest gaming event of the year, the Extra Life Gaming Marathon. You don't want to miss this one, people. Like, if you're anywhere local, if you're in Ohio, I, I, drove, to, I drove to Columbus for Origins. Come on, drive up to Windsor. Like, th this is going to be worth it. Uh, and for me, I need to get this, make sure the stream is uh, prepped and locked down. Uh, and I've got some camera tests to run to make sure that everything is actually going to work the way I want because the piece of hardware I, I want doesn't even exist until after Extra Life. So uh, I hope you get to play some games too, though. I hope you're not just all doing the stream. Well, I, I, I fully expect that I think, uh, you know, once we, once we get into the late night, that well, yeah. uh, I, you know, we'll I'll, I'll pull up to one of the tables and and put my ears in and have the stream chat running into my ears yeah. if necessary, so that I can just play. But to be honest, I don't expect a lot of people to watch, but yeah. hey, we're gonna put it out there. If people want to join, there's gonna be yeah. a donate button down below. We want people to spend some money. And what we should try to figure out is the food thing. We got to figure that out. The the buy us food. We got to mm. get that working right. for the event. I had it set up, but we're gonna have to keep doing that. Well, and and Angie Games is talking about how you're gonna hate the. Uh, uh, auction because it's going to last three hours, but we do have the option to swap you out. So, I mean, I can, yes. I can do some of that. Uh, if we want, if we want to swap out and you're, you're dying. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I should, we should have pointed that out when we're talking about, you know what, to be an auctioneer is not that hard. No, I've now, I've now done it six times. It's not yep. terrible. Nope. We had a real auctioneer one year. Um, that's about it. Like, and then, then it's going to be the, the extra life con crud, the equivalent, the, the con drop of extra life, right? <laughs> it's, it's basically a con for us, right? It's a two day con. It's, it's a big deal. I'm, I'm probably going to crash Hirsch. Yep. And now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Roger Malash, we'll see you at Extra Life. David Miller Jr., thanks. Roger Linscott Jr., thank you. Brian Kurtz, thanks. Yuho Rutila, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end. We're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Or drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like this content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts in doing so, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. on Tuesday every week. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30 p.m. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.